Hi, I'm Susan Jane Gilman. Thank you for coming to the Ice Cream Queen of Orchard Street. Um, I'm going to speak today a bit about the creative process because the Ice Cream Queen of Orchard Street is my fourth book, but it's only my first novel. I always intended to be a novelist, but it took me about 30 years to get here. My first books were all sort of were nonfiction, and um, they came they came out of a very different place than the Ice Cream Queen. I wanted to be a novelist since I was eight years old. I used to buy little notebooks at the dime store and divide them in half and write the story on top and illustrate them on the bottom. And I wrote my first novel at age nine. It was called Bunny House. It was about Bobby and Bonnie Bunny and how they wanted to convince their mother to buy them chocolate-covered carrots. And I was so sure the way you can when you were only nine years old that the world might believe there were these anthropomorphized rabbits running around that I wrote at the beginning of the book, this is fiction. I made this up. None of it is real. I find myself now into my fourth book having to tell people, this is fiction. I made this up. It's not real. It's an immigrant story, an historic story, and people have tended to think of it as fact. I've been getting angry emails that this woman does not exist, that they have Googled Dunkel's ice cream and they can't find it anywhere. I am a liar. So I want to go back a little bit and tell you how this came about because, ironically, my other books were nonfiction. I always assumed that I would write stories, that I would make up stories the way I loved to do as a child. But as I grew up and became a writer, I kept getting distracted by things in our culture. Um, I set out to write the great American novel, or the mediocre American novel. I would just be happy with a novel. When I had broke up with a young man I was living with and did not want to marry, and somebody sent me a book called The Rules, Time-Tested Tips for Capturing the Heart of Mr. Wright. And The Rules essentially act, uh, urge young women to act like diet soda. Be artificially sweet and bubbly for the rest of your life, and you can trick a man into marrying you. And I said to some friends of mine, there ought to be a book about catching a life, not a husband. Something that helps us deal with all the messages we get as women, such as uh, the fact that you know they, people say that our bodies are more important than our brains. How do you deal with relatives who are putting pressure on you to get married? How do you treat your friends? How do you gain political power, negotiate a salary? All the things that are important to us as young women that will empower us, but it has to be funny and it has to be short because we're busy. And they looked at me and they said, well, you're the writer. You go ahead and write it. And I'd been working on a precious book of short stories. I'd been writing, working on the novel. But this was the book that sort of resonated with publishers. And before I knew it, I had a bestseller. It was called Kiss My Tiara, How to Rule the World as a Smart Mouth Goddess. So then, OK, I sat down. I'm going to write the novel. And September 11th happened. I'm a native New Yorker. My whole family was here, except my husband and I at that time were in Washington, DC. And it was a very bad day. And afterwards, the only thing I wanted to read were true stories, but funny stories, light stories, something that kept me from having to take Xanax and that gave me hope in humanity. And yet, when I read the books that young women were writing, all these memoirs were about being single or going shopping. And I thought, my god, there's so much more to our lives than that. And so I got the genesis for my next book, which was called Hypocrite in a Poofy White Dress. I wrote all of my misadventures growing up. I was raised by urban hippies in New York City, where I grew up uh, sort, of, sort of the one white kid in an all Puerto Rican neighborhood. We had to follow a Maharishi under my parents. I then chased the Rolling Stones and dined with them. And of course, all of this led to my working for the US Congress. And I put all of these stories in a book. And that when that became a bestseller, I said, OK, now. Now I'm going to write the novel. I'd actually had an idea which was based, again, on something that I had lived through myself. When I was 21 years old and I got out of college, a friend of mine and I, in a drunken night at a pancake house, came up with a plan that only two drunk 21-year-olds at an IHOP could come up with, which was to travel the world based on the placemat at the International House of Pancakes. And we thought, we're going to plan this epic trip, and we're going to start where nobody we know has gone before in the People's Republic of China. 
Now, China at that time, this was in the late 80s, would be the equivalent of deciding to go to backpack through North Korea today. It was a country that up until then had really been in lockdown. There were no direct flights. There were no direct phone lines. It was sort of it was like a great mystery to most people. But we decided we were young. We were educated. How hard could this be? And we found out. We arrived in China not speaking any Mandarin. We hadn't even looked at a map. And we found ourselves quickly over our heads. We were under government surveillance most of the time. Every time we stopped on the street, they hadn't seen us. The Chinese people had not seen Westerners tromping through and me, you know, in an 80s cutoff sweatshirt with rhinestone earrings. And we were the freak show. And so whenever we would just stoop down to tie our shoe or to get something out of our pockets, we'd get crowds of people around us. So we were constantly watched. And we were hungry because unbeknownst to us, there were not a lot of restaurants in communist China back then. And if they were, their menus were all in Chinese. And they didn't have pictures. And this is so immensely naive, but we were surprised. And so we were hungry. And we started to fall apart. I got very sick physically from the pollution and the stress. And my friend started to become mentally unhinged. It got so bad, we almost did not make it out of the People's Republic of China. And it became sort of our heart of darkness. So this is what I had planned. It was such a sort of spectacular and unbelievable story. This would be the novel. This was the book I was meant to write. Except there was a problem. At that time, we had just gone to, uh, we being the United States, had just gone to war in Iraq for the second time. And I overheard our president, well, overheard, like on television, saying that the invasion of Iraq would be a cakewalk. And I turned to my husband and I said, that sounds like something stupid I would have said at 21 in the IHOP. The idea that we could just go into another country and it would be easy. And at the same time, there were a, a whole slew of books that came out around then about people who having a midlife crisis went to an ashram in India or decided to help mend their broken heart by eating a lot of pasta in Italy or by fixing up a house in Tuscany. There was a general feeling politically, socially, culturally in the United States that all these other countries in the world were really there for our enrichment, for our own personal makeover or for our national gain. And I had f gone through a situation where traveling abroad was not about conquering. It was about surrender and humility. And so I realized I had to tell the story of what happened to me in China as the truth and talk about what it's like to be humiliated, to behave badly and have bad things happen to you, and also the unexpected things and the goodness of people from many different cultures who really just saved us. And so that became my third book, Undress Me in the Temple of Heaven. And it's a true story. People never think that it's true. They think it's a novel. So then I could turn finally, finally to writing the novel. The Ice Cream Queen of Orchard Street. Um, w the inspiration for this was born out of my being a New Yorker and obsessed with ice cream. I am the founder of the Susan Jane Gilman Institute of Advanced Gelato Studies. The research is extensive, ongoing. If anybody here wants to help be a research fellow, see me afterwards. I'll hook you up. As such, uh, I used to love a local brand here. It was all along the Northeast. I don't know who here remembers it, but it was called Carvel. And Tom Carvel was the owner, and he did his own commercials. And you can probably, I mean, if you're watching YouTube, you know, Google it. Uh, he, they would have ice cream cakes, novelty ice cream cakes, Fudgy the Whale, Cookie Puss. I'm not making that up. I don't know who came up with Cookie Puss. And he would get on and he'd say, have a nice fudgy the whale cake for a whale of a dad on Father's Day. And he was so gravelly and these ads were so homespun that you felt you had to eat Carvel ice cream or he might have a heart attack. So one night I was playing this for my husband on YouTube and um, I googled Tom Carvel to read about him. His name was Tom Carvalis. He was a Greek immigrant who arrived in the United States with nothing. And slowly, he built this empire of ice cream franchises. And it struck a chord in me. I said, that would make a really interesting story. 
Then I read about Hagen Doss, another one of my personal favorites, which is this sort of uh, you know luxury Scandinavian brand of ice cream. It was created by two Jewish immigrants in the Bronx. Um, their parents had come over from Russia. They too were poor, and they wanted to create a luxury ice cream. And they created this sort of fake Danish feel and name to it because they felt the Danes had been really good to the Jews during the Holocaust. When I read their story too, rags to riches, again, I had to write about this. But there was a problem. All these real life ice cream makers, Tom Carvel, Rose and Ruben Mattis, the founders of Hagen dazs they were all genuinely good people. They had their dreams come true in America, making something sweet that everybody loved. They were generous. They loved children. They had foundations. This is not interesting as a novelist. I have had an impulse for a long time to write a really delicious, difficult female anti-hero. I feel like we haven't had a lot of them in modern American literature, not really skin, since Scarlett O'Hara. We've had some psychopaths. We've had some people who start off bad but wind up good. But I wanted somebody whose own bravado and chutzpah and sheer tenacity, even though she's difficult and unlikable, makes her rise. And then I thought, oh, what if somebody who was like Leona Helmsley or Martha Stewart created an empire ice cream, an ice cream empire? What if somebody like that, what if Paula Dean had a children's kitty show on Sunday mornings? What would that look like? That got interesting. And so the ice cream queen of Orchard Street was born. It is the tale of a little immigrant girl, Malka Trinovsky, who arrives in New York City in 1913, where she's immediately crippled and abandoned on the streets of the Lower East Side. She's taken in by the man who accidentally cripples her, an Italian ices maker, Salvatore Danello. And through her own tenacity as an orphan, as somebody who's handicapped, as a Jew, a female, a child in the middle of, of a vast city, through her own tenacity and cunning, she rises over the course of 70 years to become a woman who President Eisenhower himself christens the ice cream queen of America. She is the doyen of an ice cream empire along with her husband, Bert. She has her own Sunday morning TV show. She is a celebrity. She's a spokeswoman. She's everybody's ice cream mama. She hates kids. She would rather drink than eat ice cream. And she is difficult. And in the course of her story, we hear her rise and her spectacular fall. So I'm going to introduce you a little bit to her. I will read you just the beginning where a book should start. And you will hear her voice and who she is. Um, just so you know, I recorded the audio book of this. So um, I've learned to channel the character. So you will get to meet her in the beginning. We'd been in America just three months when the horse ran over me. I don't know exactly how old I was, six perhaps. When I was born, they didn't keep records. All I remember was running down Hester Street looking for Papa. Overhead, a bleached sky was flanked by rooftops, iron fire escapes. Pigeons circled, street peddlers shouted, chickens squawked. There was the strange, rickety calliope of the organ grinder. Great upheavals of dust swirled around the push carts, making the shop signs swing back and forth like flags. I heard a clop, then I was tumbling. There was a split second flash of hoof, then a white hot bolt of pain, then nothing. The horse that trampled me was pulling a penny ices cart. What a peculiar twist of fate that turned out to be, no? If I'd been crippled by, say, a ragman or a coal vendor, I would never have become Lillian Dunkel, as the world knows her today. Certainly, I would never have become a legend at all. The public, however, always assumes that my fortunes are due solely to my husband. Oh, how the media hates its queens, how it begrudges us. That horrible photograph the newspapers keep running now, the one that makes me look like Joan Crawford getting an enema, is all the proof you need. So quick they are to judge. But let me tell you, darlings, the wonder tundra with chocolate chips, rainbow sprinkles, or chopped peanuts mixed into order, our signature novelty cake, vanilla Rilla, molded into the shape of our trademark cartoon monkey, coated in shaved coconut with a secret cookie crunch layer inside, 
We'd first marketed it for birthdays and Father's Day, but do you realize how many of you ordered versions of this for your weddings? We did one custom cake out at a reception in Syosset that fed 215 people. It would have made the Guinness Book of World Records if Bert had remembered the goddamn camera. The Tower of Sprinkles, the Mint Everest, the Fudgy Puppy. All of these, all of these, millions sold every year, were my concoctions, my ideas. President Dwight D. Eisenhower himself once christened me the Ice Cream Queen of America. I have the signed photograph of us, in fact, with Mamie, of course, all pearls, bad teeth, shaking hands in the rose garden. I'm wearing my first ever Chanel suit, too, very nearly the color of strawberry ice cream. And this was years before Jackie Kennedy, thank you. Today, I have no fewer than three dozen engraved trophies, plaques, ribbons, plus an entire wall of certificates from the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce, the American Dairy Association, Dow Chemical, even the Institute of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in Rishikesh, India. Yogis love ice cream, apparently. Who knew? Yet when people hear my name now, all they think of are sordid headlines. A single incident on live television. Claims of tax evasion and arrest, wrongful too, need I remind you? Unfunny jokes on Johnny Carson, that schlemiel. You want funny, please. I know from funny. Just yesterday, my grandson informed me that I'm even an answer in the latest edition of Trivial Pursuit. Wow, Grandma, how awesome is that, he said. Live long enough, I suppose, you see everything. But it's a witch hunt. It was only a local television station, for God's sake, and we aired at 7 a.m. on a Sunday. A Sunday! And maybe I had had a few drinks. But darlings, you try hosting a kiddie show for 13 goddamn years. But oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so we meet Lillian Dunkel. The book begins, she is 75 years old and under indictment. And yet it toggles back and forth where she begins to tell us about her very beginnings in New York City and her rise. And then, of course, we learn about her fall. When I started out, this was sort of just the trajectory I had. Success, downfall, and then, well, to find out what happens, you have to read it. But as I started to research, I began to learn things about American history. Because as I first became obsessed, of course, with the ice cream. This woman knows everything about it, where it came from, the history of it. And as I learned more about what ice cream production was like in 20th century America, I saw that it was intimately tied to the biggest events that happened in our country. For example, prohibition was fantastic for ice cream production. Because you had all these saloon owners and tavern keepers what were they going to do with their properties? Not everybody could make a speakeasy. And so they turned all these bars into ice cream parlors, which makes sense because, you know, the old-fashioned ice cream parlors sometimes, you know, they would have the stained, you know, stained glass lamps in them. Sometimes they would have a high bar. That's because they probably sold alcohol. And what people don't realize is during the Roaring Twenties, when you're reading about bathtub gin, actually more ice cream was sold than bootleg liquor. There were more ice cream parlors than there were speakeasies. So the production really took off then. And of course then comes the Great Depression and with it also the repeal of prohibition. And the ice cream production plummets, so much so that you started having bootleg ice cream makers. And these were people who would make ice cream not, under, not up to standard. They would use like milk powder and less milk fat and sugar. And they'd sell it under the table to legitimate producers who would pawn it off as their own product. So you had this whole black market of fake ice cream going on. And then in World War II, the United States government became the largest ice cream producer in history. And so I'm going to read one small little section here, which shows you how this impacts Lillian Dunkel's life. Because what happens is that as an ice cream maker, she ends up being impacted by American history and also affecting it. Her fate is entwined with that of our country itself. And then after this, I'll take any questions. Imagine a single regiment of beleaguered men landing on a tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific. 
As they stumble onto an empty white scythe of beach, a lone Japanese warplane rips overhead. Yet just as quickly, it disappears. The horizon seems to absorb it. Slowly, the U.S. soldiers of the 81st Infantry realize they are alone. The Japanese have believed that the sheer size of the Pacific will hobble America's war efforts. The distances to refuel are simply too cumbersome. Yet the islet of Ulithi is perfectly situated between Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. Its volcanic crags barely poke above the ocean. And the Japanese have relinquished it. Within a single month of the autumn of 1944, the United States converts this blip in the ocean into the largest secret naval base in history. A port is constructed holding several hundred vessels. An airstrip is cleared. Floating dry docks are brought in to repair enormous battleships. An entire water distillation plant is anchored beside a bakery large enough to grind out thousands of loaves of bread, cake, and pies every day. The Second World War. You want to know about Kristallnacht and Iwo Jima? Well, there are books and movies for that. Go take yourself to a library. What I can tell you, darlings, is that in World War II, nearly every nation on Earth stopped producing ice cream. Sugar was too scarce. Equipment had to be redirected to the war effort. In Italy, Mussolini banned ice cream simply because he woke up one morning and decided it was decadent. Only the United States of America decided ice cream was an essential item for troop morale. And so it alone continued producing, ordering ice cream freezers on submarines, tankers, cargo ships. Over the course of the war, the United States military became the largest ice cream manufacturer in the world. And in 1945, oh, in 1945, another vessel pulled into its port of Ulithi. This was called simply the ice cream barge. It was commissioned to become the world's biggest floating ice cream parlor. Made of concrete, it didn't even have an engine. It was a refrigerated leviathan that had to be towed across the Pacific. And among its crew of 23 soldiers was one civilian who'd been given a special dispensation from the Army Corps of Engineers. He alone was in charge of overseeing the enormous ice cream freezer that churned out 15,000 gallons of ice cream per day. For the duration of the war, he alone toiled inside the concrete hull, ensuring that the machinery he helped design remain in perfect working order. This man, of course, was my husband, Bert. And so there you have it. You have the story of Lillian Dunkel. You have the story of ice cream. You have the story of the United States of America. And this has become uh, what started as a small idea watching, uh, Googling an advertisement for the ice cream of my childhood, uh, and a beloved gravelly Greek immigrant who I didn't even know was such. And it turned into a 500-page historic delicious novel. Thank you for listening. Um, questions? <laughs> Yes. Yes, Ms. Gilman. How different, you, you mentioned your other books were uh, nonfiction. How different is the creative process versus fiction and nonfiction? Ooh, good question. Um, writing a novel is um, harder by a power of 10, if not 100. Um, with nonfiction, the challenge is, you know, you've lived the story, so you know how it's going to end. The challenge is how do you tell it? What do you keep in? What do you leave out? What, you know, what can you show and not tell? With a novel, the whole story is open. So you can make things up. Anything can go any which way. So it's a chronic decision-making process. What's going to happen to the character? How are they going to get from point A to point B? If you want to move them from New York to San Francisco, do you show them looking for their car keys? Do you just start them off in the car? Do you put them on the George Washington Bridge? Or do you just say, that autumn we moved to San Francisco? So when I was writing this and coming up with the plot, every single day I was trying to decide where they should go and what they should do and how to tell it. By the time my husband came home every night, I was pretty much a mess. And I couldn't decide anything. He'd say, do you want ravioli or do you want uh, regular pasta for dinner? And I could, uh, I don't know. 
you decide, I, I can't, I can't, th I can't make another decision. And um, I lived it and I breathed it uh, in a certain way that you don't with nonfiction because you're trying to conjure up these other people in your head. Uh, what I also found too as I was working on it is that there were times I could write 60 or 70 pages only to realize I was writing the wrong story or the wrong part of the story. It was as if I wanted to move my characters from New York to San Francisco and it wasn't until I got them up to Toronto I realized that they'd taken the wrong turn and I had to scrap that. So there were times, there were several scenes, chunks, chapters that I just had to jettison and start over with. The same time, I mean, there's something I just loved about it um, that's more fun than nonfiction because you get to explore and create. Yes? So now that you've written your novel, did you get it out of your system? And what are you going to write now? Oh, I did not get it out of my system. Um, I'm not even sick of ice cream. I guess I'm going to have to write another novel. Um, it, it's a little addictive in a very masochistic kind of way, maybe, you know, like mountain climbing. You know, it's painful. You say, why am I doing this? And then as soon as it's done, you just want to do it again. Um, I have several ideas buzzing around in my head, but I don't know, you know, how, how it is with people in the room, but when you're in, for me, if I'm doing something creatively, if I talk about it, I essentially sort of like lose the momentum behind it. So I'll leave you guessing. Yes? Yeah. In this one as well, there seems to be a, um, a little bit of a, an undertone. Sometimes it's more overt, sometimes less, but in, in sort of feminine development. Women, uh, stories of powerful women or women becoming powerful or something. Uh, I'm curious if you have encountered, because it is, as you pointed out, a, a hefty book, uh, with young women today, you know, with young people today in general, we have these short attention spans and everybody's bouncing around. Do you have, have you encountered challenges with relating to young women? That's a good question. Um, I think because even though I would no longer fall into the rubric of young woman, but I'm perpetually immature, I don't have trouble bonding um, at all. You know, I, I can fit right in with 15-year-olds or 25 or 35-year-olds. Um, I think women really respond to other women when we speak the truth. We are not sanctimonious. We have a good sense of humor. And, you know, we just remember what it was like. I feel like I'm all ages at all times. Um, and there's so much dreck that is still being geared towards women. Um, there's this phrase, chick lit, which is really offensive. There's a, there are all kinds of genres in literature. There's YA, young adult. There's, you know, there's dystopian lit. There's sci-fi. There's thriller. There's crime. Only the phrase chick lit carries this really negative connotation, the idea being that it's by, by young women, for young women, and therefore it's stupid and brainless and it's touchy-feely and about emotions. And that's not to say that there aren't books like that out there, but it's used to sort of tar anything by women <laughs> or, f or with women who might be included or even part of the audience. And I find that makes it much harder. And I think uh, my fellow writers older and younger than me find that is just being given sort of legitimacy if you're writing from a point of view of your half of the species. And readers, um, I get a lot of email from men. I didn't think I would like your book, they start out. Your, my wife was reading your book next to me in bed and laughing. My girlfriend gave me your book. I wanted to, you know, I saw that my girlfriends were passing around your book and wondered what this was. And I read it, and it was really funny, and it was really good, and I got a lot out of it. And there's this surprise. So that's what I hear from the men. And from the women, um, I get, you understand me. I can't believe it. I'm a six, you know, I got one. I'm a 16-year-old gay woman out in Oklahoma, and when I read Kiss My Tiara, I felt like I wasn't alone for the first time. Or my friends and I backpacked. We went backpacking, and I felt so freaked out that something was wrong with me because I wasn't having a good time. I loved Undressed Me in the Temple of Heaven. When you speak to a truth that is not about, you know, girly stuff and, you know, about hair and makeup and diet and being decorative, I think women respond to that. We're hungry for it because so much of what is geared towards us, whether we're seven or 70, it's pink, purple sparkles. Yes? Since we are here, like you said, Google, how, how have you seen maybe technology change book reading habits or book selling habits? Oh, e-books, e-books, e-books. Um, 
it's, it's changed the industry, first, obviously, because people can, I'll tell people about a book and they'll say, hang on, and they'll get on their technology and they'll download it instantly. And for a writer, in a certain way, that's kind of great. You know, I get a lot of, oh, where's your book? Oh, I'll go pick it up at the library. And there they buy it in front of you. That's kind of cool. The problem is then you can't see people reading it in front of you. There's something really nice, you know, I was on the Amtrak and I look up and somebody's like this. For a writer, like that makes your heart sing. It's like, oh my God. And so, electri so the technology has made it harder for your book to be anything but, you know, but digits, but binary code. And that's a little um, unnerving if you're a writer. Certainly now all of us writers, you know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I have a blog. I don't have time for Tumblr because I'm actually going to try to write another book. But it, it sort of, it does diffuse our, our own attention and our own writing. And then there's everything that's going on right now with publishers, with uh, the pricing of ebooks, with Amazon, and, you know, that's a whole other mess, which is, in my mind, threatening writers because there is talk about doing away with traditional publishing houses. And I will say this since I have a forum. Um, I read something yesterday about how if Amazon does away with traditional publishers, it's a good thing. Writers don't need editors. All you need is a good spell check program and an editing program, and you can do it yourself. So I would like to say this. My editors are not middlemen, and my editors cannot be replaced by a program. Anybody who's an athlete who's had a great coach or who's, who's a musician who is a great teacher or a great producer knows that you need somebody if you are a creative person or if you have a talent to help you be better. I've had all the editors I've had have been really spectacular. They have vision, they handhold, they deal with us writers, we're a little mercurial, they keep us on track, they help us become better, they push us, and they make our products better. I don't want to work in a day where I don't have a publishing house. Plus, there's not just spell checking, there is uh, there's um, figuring out where a book fits into the world. What, you know, are you just writing something that's been out there already? There's institutional memory. There is copy editing. There's fact checking. There's legal vetting. There's book design. These are important things. And my, the writers I know who are self-publishing in this world, taking advantage of all the electronica, are finding they still want a really good editor. They want a sounding board. They need a copy, a copy editor. They need a proofreader. They need somebody to help them fact, check their facts. They want a designer. They want it to look good. Except because they're self-publishing using the technology, they have to pay for this all out of pocket themselves. So what the world could look like is that unless you have enough money to fully subsidize your own virtual publishing house, um, the work that comes out there is going to be uh, either shoddy and or just written by people of means. So um, I see technology on one hand putting books into so many more hands in a much faster way and giving me as an author a lot of ways including this to interact with people which is great because usually we authors, we, it's not glamorous. You sit alone in a room three, four, five years. That's the writing process. Nobody's doing a reality show about authors where we're given an assignment, we write a book each week, and then we're eliminated based on who is the best book and who is the worst. It's just this boring, very limited process. So to have social media, great. But the idea that um, technology could rep replace publishers and editors that, or even just a, a nice hardcover book to hold in your hand or bop somebody over the head with, uh, that I'm going to miss. Yes? Ooh, um, how do you make a character authentic? Uh, you just keep digging. Um, anything that when I write a character that comes a little too easily or that sounds like somebody I've heard before, then I, you, know, you have to check it for being, for lack of a better word, shtick. Um, and the more, sort of like the more you immerse yourself in the world, you think about things. And it's kind of an acting exercise. I took some theater classes when I was really young, like in junior high school, and I still call upon that to get into their heads. As a writer, I think, you know, you jump, I'm every character in the book here. I'm Spreckles the Clown, who, which is played by a, a closeted gay man named Harvey Va Valentine, who shows up in the 50s. I'm her 19-year-old grandson, Jason. I'm her dyslexic husband, Bert. I am the Danellos, the immigrants who, who come and bring her in. At some point, 
you have to get into their head and imagine how is it going to be and what would life be like and how would people see things. You're constantly sort of shape-shifting as a writer. And we're all, I think all of us, I can speak, are on the lookout for cliché, for keeping something alive. And there are also skills you learn as a writer. I, I went to an MFA program, and there tends to be an idea that we writers, you know, we're hit with a bolt of inspiration that just pours out of us. But there are tools to writing, like there are to playing music or playing a sport. There, you learn how to show, not tell. You learn how to write a third dimensional, a three dimensional character. You learn how using a different point of view will create a different tone. There's just practical stuff. And the more you do it, one hopes the better you become. Yes? Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you had set out to write a historical novel or if that was just a story that presented itself to you. And then also if you think that that sort of structure of facts that come from the history or sort of placing your story within helped you kind of structure your first fiction work. Yeah, I didn't realize that this was going to be so historical. And you're right. I mean, most, most of my work has been very reactive. I have to respond to something that's pissing me off in the culture with an entire book. This was the first one that was more of a valentine that came of love. But I think I was responding to, to the lack of these really kind of complicated, yummy, awful, wonderful anti-heroes. I wanted to do a female. So, so there was some of that. This book grew. I mean, I was joking about calling it the Moby Dick of ice cream at one point because I had so much about the history of ice cream and the chemistry. And I, it really revealed itself to me as I did the research to find how much ice cream history um, happened in the 20th century and how it w became integrated into my character's experience. So the, the book sort of mushroomed for, and became more, more, the history itself became integral to her story as opposed to I first envisioned it as just a backdrop like, oh, old New York, that would be really cool. Nobody's written about that before. But I, you know, I thought I would do it in a new way. And there we go. I think so. Um, not probably. I would not go back to the immigrant story again. We're not going to have like a Liver Queen of Ludlow Street, or. Um, but a few of the ideas I have floating around. You hear about these little nuggets or things that happened in history, and you go, nobody told me about that. Oh my gosh. Ooh. You know. And then you want to pull at the thread and see what it leads to. It's fun. It's archaeology. I like the research. I, I worked as a journalist for, for a few years before I went, in, went into writing books. And there is that part of me that just loves to dig and uncover. I guess I have a feeling we're pretty much out of time. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for listening to uh, Lillian, the story of Lillian Dunkel and the Ice Cream Queen of Orchard Street. If anybody has questions for me afterwards, you can always email me. Um, my website is susanjanegilman.com. I'm on Facebook as, wait for it, Susan Jane Gilman. I'm on Twitter, Susan J. Gilman. I'm on Instagram, something or other, Susan J. Gilman too, I think, S.J. Gilman. I'm all over the media. Come. Uh, Come visit me, talk to me. I'd love to see you. Thank you.